So we're up to the sixth chapter now in our study of Romans, and we're beginning this evening at the very first verse, Romans chapter 6, beginning at verse 1, and the word of the Lord reads, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now I'm going to stop at verse 7 uh, at this point anyway. We may move beyond that tonight. We may not even get to that tonight. I don't know. All right. This is a, a very important area. When you start using that little three-letter word, there's no bigger word in the Bible that causes more people to trip and stumble than the word S-I-N, sin. People don't seem to understand, and it amazes me. I've, I've come to realize, being in ministry as long as I've been in ministry, that what happens is, when Christians get to this word, Brother Jack, they go in one of two directions. And all of a sudden, you've got those that go off in this legalistic direction. Yeah. And they define sin as actions, behaviors, things we do that are contradictory to the law of God, so on and so forth. And people don't seem to understand that the term sin in the Word of God has a couple of different definitions, a couple of different applications. There are times when the Word of God speaks of sin... And it speaks simply of a state of unbelief. For instance, we're, God's, we're shaping in sin. We're born in iniquity. That doesn't mean you're shaping in bad actions and bad behavior. No, how, it, that doesn't even make sense. So the concept of original sin, that we're born into a state of sin, that doesn't mean we're born into actions that are contrary to the law of God. No, it means that from the moment we're born in a human flesh and blood mortal existence, we are born into a state of unbelief. Even a child has to be shown the gospel. Even a child has to be taught about God. It's not like a kid who grows up in the woods being raised by wolves yeah. is going to come out of the woods worshiping God. Right. Uh -huh. It's not going to happen. We're born in a, in a state of unbelief. The concept of God is not something that we're immediately born with. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now I do believe that there is an innate understanding of the divine that we're all born with. I do believe that human beings are the only species on the planet that worship, that have religious form and, you know, uh, and focus. And I do believe that there's a hunger and there's, there's a concept as we grow older, there is a concept of something bigger than we are, something more than we are, that we begin to kind of come into focus with. That I do believe. Yes. And this leads us then in the direction of God. The Word of God said that they that come to God must first believe that He is, 
and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. But there has to be something in us that makes, makes us even look Godward mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. to begin with. And I do believe that God has designed us with that hunger, with that desire. There's, there's that thing within us that helps us to know there's got to be something more. Than just this physical flesh and blood. I can't even fathom people, honestly, who claim to believe that this life is all there is. If they honestly believe that, my God, what a miserable existence that must be. What a horrible thought that must be. I can't even imagine, I can't even fathom that. I look at people in this world who suffer. I look at people in this world who go through uh, great trials and difficulties. And I thank God that there is hope for more than this. Yes. Amen. I'm glad for them that when this life is over, there is hope for more than this. Yes. You know, I talked Sunday about the fact that Jesus, the Lord said, the poor you shall have with you always. And how that... Uh, this prosperity mess has led so many of God's people astray. But you know, what we cannot handle in this life, we'll not only handle, but we'll have in the life to come. Amen. Amen. You may never wear gold in this life, but honey, you'll walk on it in the next. Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. You may never even own a home in this life, but you'll have a mansion in the next. Praise yes. the Lord. Yes. You may not ever uh, be able to afford anything in this life. You may never be able to travel and, and explore and see, but in the life to come, you'll be able to do all the exploring and all the traveling that you never want to do. And you'll be able to enjoy all the fullness of God's creation. For the Word of God tells us He's created all these things for us to enjoy. Hallelujah. So, I have that hope because of my faith. If I didn't have my faith and I didn't believe that there's more to this life. Ooh, what a horrible thing. Yeah. Amen. Watch a young believer die in a car wreck or watch a young person die with some terrible disease or, you know, condition and think, well, they only had, you know, an 18-year stint on this planet and then they were gone and then there's nothing more for them. What a horrible thought. No, if they were a child of God, born again the Bible way, my Bible said, I have not seen, ear hath not heard, neither hath entered into the heart of men the things which God hath prepared for them that love Him. I think there's a whole lot more. Jesus said, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not true, I would have told you. Hallelujah. So we have that belief, we have that sense, that inward knowledge that there's something more. And I believe that's in every human being. Yes. I really do. Every human. We're the only race of animal, <coughs> the only species of animal scientifically on this planet that can even grasp that concept. Right. Mm -hmm. Think about that. Isn't that interesting? We can grasp the concept that there is a spiritual existence that goes beyond the natural existence. There is something within the invisible realm that goes beyond the, the visible realm. Right. That's right. We can grasp these sort of things. Our dog can't. That's right. The deer of the field can't. The whale in the ocean can't. But we as human beings can't. And when you take into account that human beings use just a very small, right. tiny percentage of the ability within our minds. Yeah. Yeah. Dear God, have mercy. Right. Mm -hmm. What in the world would it be if we were honestly able to tap into the full resource of the full power of our minds? Mm -hmm. You know, they talk about Things like uh, being able to move objects and things like that with your mind, you know. Yeah. 
Well, I'll tell you now, it may very well be that were we able to tap into the full power of our mind, that such things would be possible. But we, we can't even fathom it because our brains just can't get around, you know. And it may very well be that if our minds were more fully available to us, we would have the better ability to understand the supernatural and the miraculous and the spiritual. Amen. See, people love to say that the only folks that believe in God, the only people who are religious in nature are ignorant and stupid people. That is so untrue. That is so untrue. One pastor in the church of God about 30 years or better ago, uh, probably longer than that even now, he was starting a work or felt led of the Lord to start a work in uh, Atlanta, Georgia. And the Lord spoke to him and said, I want you to build this church in this community in Atlanta, Georgia. What community? The richest, the wealthiest community. And the Lord told him why. The Lord said, there are detractors who claim that only ignorant and foolish and unlearned and poor people are attracted to this message of Pentecost. Only ignorant and foolish and poor people believe in the foolishness of being filled with the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking with other tongues. Only ignorant, foolish and, and poor people believe in the divine healing. And the move of God and shouting and dancing in the aisles. All those things are born of ignorance and, and poverty. And the Lord said, I'm going to prove that theory wrong and I'm going to use you to do it. Amen. Yes. And this man started his church in the wealthiest community in Atlanta, Georgia, and there's a lot of old money in Atlanta, Georgia, yeah. as well today as a lot of new money. That church grew to become, for many years, the largest Protestant church in the entire uh, Americas. For many years, they had over 50,000 members. He eventually got to the place. And you ought to see this place. I, when I stayed in Georgia, it was so cool. I, we'd go by there sometime on Sunday morning. And there would be, would be limousines lined up to drop their cargo off at the entrance. And there were Lincolns. And there were Rolls's. And there were Mercedes. And there were... I mean, you know... And it was just amazing. And here the Lincolns lined up and the chauffeurs are getting out and opening the door so that their wealthy, prosperous, intelligent, educated church members who believe in the baptism of the Holy Ghost, who believe in speaking with other tongues as the Spirit of God gives the utterance, who believe in divine healing. My Lord have mercy. Could get out of their cars and go to church and shout a little. Yes, amen. And I told you before, I'll tell you again, I, I haven't, uh, my district uh, home missions director here in Texas, when I was pastoring outside of Fort Worth back in the mid-80s, Brother Prince, and that name fit him because he was honestly a prince of a man. Absolutely a prince among men. Brother Prince pastored a church over there in, uh, what's, what's the name of that town, if I can think of it? Hearst. A lot of money over there in Hearst, I'm going to tell you. And he invited Stacy and I, the girl I married, he invited us to come and visit them one Sunday. So we went, and I told Stacy, I said, I don't know what to expect. I've heard that. This is a very well-to-do church. There's a lot of money here. As I don't know what to expect out of this. We went to that church, and Brother Prince, let me tell you, was holiness. He was holiness. 
We went to that church and we pulled in the parking lot with this big stupid grin come across my face. I said, dear God, look at this parking lot. Oh, my little junker car looked like, I'm surprised somebody didn't tow it just because it didn't look like it belonged there. All, you know, Bentleys and Rolls Royce and Lincolns and Mercedes and I mean all these highfalutin fancy cars in the parking lot, you know. And we're walking in, and oh, I just knew I was going to feel out of place. I knew I was going to be uncomfortable because all these people got money, and you know. And we went in there. During the course of the worship service, Brother Prince shouted all over that platform, danced up and down the aisles. I said, oh, well, I guess the Holy Ghost is as real among rich, educated folk as he is among the poor, uneducated folk. Amen. Amen. And I'm going to tell you, they had a marvelous anointing of the Holy Ghost in that church. A wonderful presence of God in that church. So I'm here to tell you today, there is a natural understanding. It's almost a given in human thinking. Now for those that want to talk about evolution, well then honey, I got a little news for you. Human beings evolved with a desire to pursue that which is supernatural. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. If you want to claim everything's the byproduct of evolution, well, sweetheart, our thoughts concerning God then are the byproduct of your evolution. Uh -huh. So why are you trying to do away with God with your theory of evolution? Yeah. That's right. yeah. It's that same evolution according to their theory, you know. Yeah. That That's right. They somehow or another, this belief yeah. in a supernatural being that created the world, somehow or another, that came into existence, sweetheart. Mm -hmm. So, either God put it in us, it was either there by divine design, or yeah. it evolved. No matter how you slice it, it's there. Uh -huh. Because you do not find... A single culture in the world, never has been a culture in the world that is atheist in nature. Uh -huh. That's right. That's, That's right. right. Amen. That's right. They have never, ever, yep. ever, ever, ever in the history of the human race unearthed a race of people That's that right. did not worship something, something. somewhere. That's right. Uh -huh. Amen. Yeah. One of the first things that uh, those who dig up, you know, ancient uh, sites and what yes, have you, right. one of the first things they begin to look at yeah. is their patterns of worship and their religious beliefs right. and their religious practices. Because yeah. no matter where you go, you're going to find it. That's right. Because going back into the deepest antiquity, there has always been some Amen. understanding in the human being that there is a God. That's uh -huh. right. Amen. Yes. Now, yes. let's get back to sin. <laughs> sin can speak of simply a state of unbelief. In other words, that state in which we all are born prior to coming to some realization or some knowledge of the existence of God. The term sin in the Word of God does not always speak to behaviors or actions. Mm -hmm. Now you've got some that come to this word and they go off in this direction and, and they wind up in going down a very legalistic road because they don't understand the concept of grace to begin with. Let me tell you a little secret. As we're studying Romans 6 tonight, you don't throw away the rest of the Bible. That's right. In order to make Romans 6 say something different, sweetheart, it's got to mesh, it's got to mingle, it has got to uh, fit in like pieces to a puzzle with the rest of what the Word of God teaches. That's right, uh -huh. amen. 
But without fail, you get those Christians who come to the word sin, and this is where there's this separation. All of a sudden, we have the opportunity to go down this legalistic road. We have the opportunity to define sin as actions and uh, deeds and things done in the yes. flesh that contradict the law of God. And that's the only way they see that word defined. That's the only way they understand that word to be defined. So it's very important tonight to understand. There are many times in Scripture you read the word sin. It is not speaking to actions. It is not speaking to behaviors. It is speaking to that state of unbelief. Having said that, Paul says in Romans 6, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Now, Paul cannot possibly be talking of sin as actions and deeds that are in contradiction to the law of God. Not at this place in Scripture he can't be. Because that would contradict the teaching of Scripture elsewhere. The Apostle John said, if we say that we have no sin, we make God a liar, and the truth is not in us. But Paul says we're dead to sin. Well, uh, see... There's one of your contradictions. No, there isn't a contradiction. We become dead, listen to me now, to that state of unbelief that we were in prior to conversion, prior to being born again. Honey, when you go down, oh, hallelujah, when you go down in the waters of baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sin, yeah. You come up a believer. Yes, yes. You cannot go back to being an unbeliever. You cannot go back to a place where God does not exist and there is no God. The Word of God said in Hebrews, it is impossible to do this because it would be impossible then to come back to God because you cannot crucify the Lord afresh. Right. right. So I say there are some people who have known God and they've been in church and they've walked with the Lord and then all of a sudden at some point in their life they go through a struggle and, and they begin to rail against God and they, they try to act like and they try to talk like they don't believe it. I've got a brother that's going through this right now. And I'm telling you right now, honey, he is not by any means embracing the notion that God is not there. He says that. Yeah. Amen. But what he is in fact doing is fist fighting with the God that he knows is there. That's right. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. Oh, glory to God. He's yeah. fighting the yes. God that he knows is there. Yes. You see, Amen. some people want to believe. The universalist teachers want to make you believe that everybody will be saved in the end. You don't have to believe the gospel. You don't have to embrace the gospel. You don't have to obey the gospel to be saved. In the end, everybody will be saved. That is not true. That's right. Paul said, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin? Shall we continue in a state of unbelief? Uh -huh. That grace might abound. Does grace cover those who have not believed? No. Grace is what causes the gospel to be offered to you. That's right. Yes, amen. Grace does not mean the gospel is applied to you in spite of yourself, in spite of your unbelief, in spite of your rejection. No. That's not how it works. You follow me. So Paul is speaking to the Romans because there are some in the midst of them who apparently have come to the notion, well, wait a minute. If God's grace is so big and so wonderful, then it really doesn't matter if we live like 
a Christian or we don't live like a Christian. It doesn't matter if we even believe this message or not. His grace will include and cover everybody. And Paul is addressing that. Yeah. Uh -huh. said, so what, shall we continue in sin that grace might abound? Shall we continue in a state of unbelief that grace might abound? No, no, Lord. no God forbid. You can't do that. Says, so how can you become dead to something and then turn around and walk in that same thing that you become dead to? What have you become dead to? Have you become dead? Has it become impossible for you to break the law of God or to do something contrary to the law? No. No. Because if you interpret this term sin, as Paul is using it here, in the fashion of it is an action or a deed, you know, then he's saying it is impossible for you to do anything any longer that breaks the law of God. That is not what Paul is saying. That's right. yes. And we know that contradicts Scripture. We know that contradicts the message of the whole. You can try to make that a message in part, mm -hmm. but to do so, you have to contradict the whole. Mm -hmm. And the Word of God tells us, and you know, I'm constantly quoting this passage over and over and over and over and over again. Line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. You cannot take a part of Scripture and make it say something that contradicts the whole of Scripture. Right. Exactly. Amen. Uh -huh. This is where most of your religious movements, even within Christianity, go wrong. Mm -hmm. This is where your cults go wrong. Mm -hmm. This is when there are a lot of churches in Christianity that go wrong. Because they take something they read here, misinterpret it, take it out of context. Now they know, they know, that if you read this one way, then it is clearly butting heads with John. Right. Yep. Hello now. Uh -huh. You know it's clearly butting heads with James. Mm -hmm. You know it's clearly butting heads with Peter. And it's clearly butting heads with what Paul has written in other places as well. Uh -huh. Paul said, oh wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of sin? Yes, amen. Said, the good that I would do, I do not. The evil that I would not do, that I do. He said, but sin reigneth. Sin is in charge of this mortal existence. So why in the world would Paul say that there and then turn around and say this here if he's talking about actions and deeds that contradict the law of God? Come on now. Wake up, people. Yes, amen. Good Lord have mercy. He's talking about that state of unbelief. He's saying you cannot start out as a believer and then decide, well, you know what? God's grace is so big that I don't even have to continue to live as a believer. I can put all thought of God out of my mind and do as I please. And all will be well because grace of God will cover me. So really, Paul here is actually addressing the universalist false doctrine. Right. Uh -huh. uh -huh. You always got people that have to take things to the extreme. Yeah. You've always got people who have to push that pendulum way over to the right or way over to the left. God help us if we try to walk down the center of the road. Yeah. One of the things that I've discovered in my own ministry over the last 21 years that I've been in affirming ministry is that God is trying to help us find the middle of the road. Yes, yes. Not the fundamentalist extreme to the right, not the universalist extreme to the left, but the middle of the road. Yeah. I wrote a comment on my Facebook page Last yesterday, I believe it was, and I made a comment, you know, that song by John Lennon that's called Imagine. <coughs> and I said, 
<clears throat> in my comment. Excuse me. I said in my comment, I've never liked that song. I'll go beyond that. I hate that song, to be frank. That song, as far as I'm concerned, it is inspired by devils. Imagine there's no religion. Right. Imagine there's no God above us. Imagine there's no private property. Imagine, and he's talking about, you know, oh, the world would just be a marvelous place if we do away with the idea of God. If we would do away with people being able to own private property. So he's, in essence, he's supporting a socialist or even a communist sort of a mentality here, okay? Imagine how wonderful the world would be if all these things could be set aside and we didn't have to deal with the idea of God and we didn't have to deal. That mentality is the mentality that is going to usher in the Antichrist and more and more people in our world are embracing that mentality by the day. Amen. And I made the comment on my Facebook and I said, I said, this is the mentality. I believe the Antichrist is in the wings. Yeah. And this is the mentality that is going to usher him into power. Well, don't you know, somebody come along and made a little comment and said, Oh, Pastor Charles, are you a closet fundamentalist? Oh, <laughs> so I wrote it back and I said, I am not a fundamentalist by any definition of the word. First of all, to be a fundamentalist, you have to believe in the Trinity. Oh, Lord. If you look at the definition of fundamentalism, that means that you embrace certain quote-unquote fundamental beliefs. Well, one of those fundamental beliefs that they claim you must believe in order to qualify as a fundamentalist is the belief in the Trinity. Well, right there, I'm at odds. Yeah. Yeah. So I said, no, I'm not a fundamentalist by any definition of the word. But do I believe that the truth is the truth? Yes, I do. And I won't apologize for that Amen. to anybody. Amen. I don't Amen. have to walk down the right side of the road. I don't have to walk down the left side right. of the road. I don't believe like the fundamentalists believe and have all these headstrong, idiotic, right-wing, hyper-conservative, misunderstanding, misinterpreting the Word of God to condemn you know everybody and everything. I don't have to be that far to the right, to still believe there are immutable truths in the Word of God. Yes, amen. amen. I don't have to be a fundamentalist tonight to believe that Jesus Christ is the only singular way to yes, God, amen. and outside of Him there is no way. Amen. You cannot find the Father through Buddha. You amen. cannot find the Father through Krishna. You cannot find the Father I don't have to be a fundamentalist to have that conviction. That's right. Amen. And one of the things I said in my post, you know, I said, the sad thing is people talk about, you know, doing away with religion and all. I said, if people would just live their religions, the world would be a better place. All right. And that includes Christians. Amen. Because right. I've got news for you, honey. There are teachings in the Word of God that most of your fundamentalists and your evangelicals flat out ignore mm -hmm. That's right. in their fervor to be holier than thou. Yeah. Uh -huh. The Word of God teaches us not to debate. That's right. Right. The Word of God teaches us not to argue. Mm -hmm. Nowhere in Scripture do I ever see the example of someone being hounded to holy hell until they finally surrender and accept the gospel of Jesus Christ. But sweetheart, that's what fundamentalists will do to you. Amen. Uh -huh. If they get you cornered, they're going to try every trick in the book, try to make you feel as guilty and as afraid. That's right. Amen. Oh, my goodness. That's what I told you before. You know, I, I mimic the fundamentalist preacher. When they get into their altar call, and all of a sudden, you know, we got to go down the fear highway. 
That's right. Because bless yeah. God, if I can't preach them into the altar telling them how much the Lord loves them, then I'll preach them into the altar telling them how this poor guy rejected Christ this night and died on his way home, hit with, you know, by a Mack truck. Well, David Wilkerson got hit by a truck and killed. Amen. So don't, don't get it twisted, as they say. Yes, amen. Reigns on the just and the unjust. Amen. Except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. That's right. But you see, we got to go down that road. we got to start trying to scare people into heaven because this tactic and work and then we got to go this way. I don't believe it. You've never seen me do it in this church. You've been, yeah. I've been in this community for 12 years. When have you ever seen me try to scare people That's into the right. altar? Right. When? Name one time you've ever seen me try to scare people into the altar. I don't. I don't. Honey, if you don't come to that altar to walk into the open, embracing arms of a loving Christ, then your relationship with God is starting out on the wrong step. It's starting out on the wrong foot. And chances are you're not going to be able to stick with it. I've always said, this is why you don't hear me get up in church and try to cajole people right. into being baptized in Jesus' name. No, right. I preach the truth, I tell the truth, I teach the truth. And when you're ready and you come to an understanding of it and you yeah. finally decide this is what I need to do, this is yeah. what I want to do, you come tell me and we'll get it done as fast as we can do it. And that's how I do it. I'm not going to sit here and you know, go into these big altar calls and try to terrify and terrorize people to get them to surrender to baptism in Jesus' name. No, you've got to go into that water in response to faith as an act of obedience, not in response to fear. Mm -hmm. right. My Lord, have mercy. That's right. Amen. Amen. Yeah. we got too many people in the church who have acted upon the mandates of Scripture out of fear. Rather than out of faith. Right. And that don't work. No. You better be operating from a place of faith. And you've heard me teach on that before. Alright, so Paul said, shall we continue in sin? Shall we continue in a state of unbelief? That grace may abound. God forbid. How are we, how shall we, that are dead to sin live any longer therein? If you are dead to unbelief, then unbelief can't even begin to manifest itself once again in your life. Right. Man. Because it's dead. Yep. Once something's dead, it's dead. Right. It's dead. So Paul is talking here about sin as a state of unbelief. He said, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death. Therefore we are buried with Him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. I love, I've said this many times, I love how people love to interpret certain passages. The Word of God said, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Former things have passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Yeah. And I just love how preachers will take that passage and they try to interpret it. And I love to say, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know, it's so funny how you have your idea as to how far this goes and where the cutoff is. Right. Yeah. If you're a homosexual and you come to the Lord, you'll leave heterosexual. Why? Oh my you were an idiot before you were converted and you're still an idiot after you've been converted. Obviously, everything doesn't change. You were ugly as a brick before you went to the altar. You're ugly as a brick after you left the altar. Everything doesn't change. He says all things become new. Well, then why isn't your eye color 
change? Why doesn't Brother Jack have hair when he didn't have hair? Why don't you leave skinny when you came down fat? Why don't you walk away white when you came down black? Obviously, everything doesn't change. Come on, how foolish can you be? Right, but we've got preachers that love to get out there and they'll hear me saying, oh, well, that's foolish. That's stupid. Why would it be foolish? Right. The passage says, all things become new. Uh -huh. yeah. Why is your definition of all accurate and my definition of all is inaccurate? Yeah. Right. Uh -huh. Amen. Yeah. How come it is that somehow you're able to define all as not being inclusive of everything? That's right. But be inclusive of whatever you decide it is inclusive That's of. That's right. Uh -huh. Amen. Hello now. Uh -huh. When the truth of the matter is this. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. He is a new creation. Yes. Yep. What has changed? The nature of unbelief. That unbelief right. nature. We've gone from unbelief to a nature of belief. Former things have passed away. What dies? What does Paul say? That sin. We die to sin. What is sin? Right. A state of unbelief. Right. Yep. <laughs> Former things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. Let me tell you something. When you kill that old nature of unbelief, yep. all of a sudden, everything you look at looks different. Yes, that's right. Yep. See, they love to say, former things have passed away, behold, all things have become new, as if it has to do with your life. Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. It's everything in your world, that's right. everything around you. Uh -huh. Hello now. Uh -huh. Everything you thought you knew, you don't know anymore. You thought you knew what that tree was, but now you see that tree is a creation of God. Right. You thought you knew what that dolphin was, but now you see that dolphin as a creation of God. Right. You thought you knew what that flower was, but now you see that flower as a creation of God. You thought you knew what that telephone pole was, but now you look at that telephone and you recognize that man hewn it from the creation of God. Amen. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. Everything becomes new. The way you yep. see, the way you look, the way you understand, the way you perceive, everything is changed. Everything is changed. Amen. That's why we as believers, we can go to the same Grand Canyon that an unbeliever goes to, that an atheist goes to, and says, oh, this was carved down by millions and millions of years of water trickling down. And, blah, 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 blah. Yep. and we stand on the banks of that great canyon and we say, oh Lord, my God, Amen. when I in awesome wonder Consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars. I hear the rolling thunder. Thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior your God to thee. How great thou art. How great thou art. I look at the same thing and I believe it looks at and my soul doth magnify the Lord. <laughs> 
mind so all of a sudden worship and adoration begins to rise up from my soul when Tommy and I are out on the ship and we're out in the water and we're looking out over those vast oceans I don't see what the unbeliever sees I don't see what the atheist sees I see what a believer sees because I've been born again hallelujah to God oh former things have passed away the way I would look is no longer the way I can look at it. Amen. Amen. And the thing I look at, I look at differently. Amen. Amen. Oh my God, have mercy. Hallelujah. Oh, I want to shout a little. Amen. I'm telling you, this is some of the best teaching in Texas. Yes. Amen. My God, have mercy. Paul said, you cannot. When once you become dead to unbelief, you can't. It's impossible to walk in it because that unbelief is dead to you. If he was talking about actions, behaviors, deeds that are contrary to the law of God, then according to this passage, he would be suggesting that it was impossible for us to do those things. We know that it's not true. And I do not say we know that it's not true in terms of we know from human experience because human experience, if it contradicts the Word of God, yeah. would not be the final authority. The Word of God would be the final authority. But yes. the Word of God tells us. The same guy that wrote this told us. Amen. That that sinful nature rules and reigns in this mortal body and it wars against the spirit of our mind. What is it war against? It wars against our faith, our belief. Oh my Lord, have mercy. God, have mercy. Amen. <laughs> How much time have we got? Ooh, we got no while. <laughs> we still got 25 minutes. So Paul says, he continues, he said, For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Serve what? Unbelief. Unbelief no longer dictates what we do and how we do it. Amen. Faith, a revelation and an understanding of God now dictates what we do and how we do it. Amen. Amen. And i got to tell you, I, I'm going to have to go down this road for a minute. It's too exciting not to. <laughs> Amen. Paul said... In verse 4, Paul said, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Notice that Paul does not say that the Father raised up Christ from the dead. That's right. That's right. He doesn't say another person raised up the Son. That's right. right. No, he said Christ was raised up by the glory of the Father. Yeah. Let me see. Jesus said, the glory that I shared with you. But wait a minute. The Word of God says that God will not Give his glory unto another. Ooh. Oh, hallelujah. For Christ to be raised up by the glory yes. of the Father. Amen. Ooh. Amen. Ooh, hallelujah. Amen. That means he had to be the Father. Amen. Hallelujah to God. Because God's glory he will not give to another. Hallelujah to God. 
Jesus said, I have the power to lay it down and I have the power to take it up again. Amen. Honey, I've got news for you. He did not need anybody else or anything Amen. belonging to anybody else to come back to life and to bring life yes. back into that mortal yes. body. Everything he needed, he had because everything he had, he was. Exactly. Hallelujah to God. He was raised by the glory of the Father because he had the glory of the Father. Glory to God. Yes. My Lord have mercy. I told you, head go down that little caveat for a minute. It was too exciting to pass. Amen. So then Paul continues in verse Again, I repeat verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. What old man? That old unbelieving man. Right. Uh -huh. Amen. Is crucified with him. That the body of sin might be destroyed. That henceforth we should not serve sin. Unbelief. For he that is dead is free from sin. Uh-huh. Now, if we be dead with Christ, here, this is so important. This is so important. This next verse is so important. If we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with Him. Present tense? Yes. Past tense? Or future tense? future. In other words, he is saying we are dead to sin the entire time we're alive in this body. We are dead to unbelief as long as we're in this body. But we believe, the byproduct now of our belief is we believe that we shall also live with him. That's coming. That's future. We believe. That he didn't say we believe that we now live with Him. We shall live. It's future tense. Are you following? In other words, a believer, oh hallelujah, lives in this life in a perpetual state of death to unbelief. Are you hearing me now? Until the rapture. Unbelief is dead to us until the rapture. And, it, when, and with unbelief being dead, what's alive? Belief. Faith. He said, therefore we believe that we shall also live with Him. Oh my God, have mercy. Watch. We're not dead. He said... Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, Reckon ye yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. He said, look at yourselves, view yourselves, understand that you are dead to unbelief. Watch. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. See again, this, this goes to that principle. He calls those things which be not as though they were. We're not resurrected yet, but we call ourselves the redeemed. No, redemption is when the Lord comes and takes His purchased possession. That's redemption. He hasn't cashed in our coupon yet. That will happen at the, uh, at the rapture, at the resurrection of the church. But we still call ourselves redeemed. We still call ourselves saved. Do you follow what I'm saying? All right. 
Because by faith, we embrace the gospel. By faith, we embrace righteousness. By faith, we embrace holiness. Uh -huh. You follow it? It's all born of that faith, which is the opposite of the unbelief which has now died to us. Yeah. All right. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that ye should obey it in the lusts thereof. Aha. Now he's starting to bring it around to a slightly more practical application, okay? Now he's saying, unbelief can manifest itself in your body. It can manifest itself in what you do and how you do it. Hello now. He said, now you're dead to unbelief. Now if you're dead to unbelief, then don't you dare let unbelief reign in your mortal body. That you should obey the lusts of the, the term lust here has nothing to do with sex. It simply means the desires. He's saying the desires of the flesh. Let me tell you what the desires of the flesh include. Wealth. This is where we get greed. This is where we get envy. This is where we get all these negative sinful things that you never hear preachers talk about because they're too busy preaching against the homosexual. Paul said, don't you let unbelief reign in your mortal body that you should obey the lusts thereof the desires of the flesh. You Don't you dare let unbelief manifest itself in your life and in your body where you're chasing down the almighty buck. And all of a sudden, you're not living like somebody who believes first and foremost above all else that there is a God. Yes, amen. And that He has purchased you and you are His purchased possession. My Lord have mercy. I'm going to tell you, most church people I know today live like unbelievers. Most church people I know today, their motivations, their desires, what drives them is no different than the atheist that lives next door to them. The only difference is they go to church and sing Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. But they're letting sin, they're letting that state, that unbelief mindset reign in their mortal bodies. All right. He said, therefore, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. But yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. So Paul said, now that you're in the new state, now that sin, now that unbelief is dead to you, said, then you should not be allowing yourself to do those things which are born of unbelief. But rather, you should be allowing yourself to do those things which are born of faith. In other words, the faith nature should now be manifesting itself in the way you carry yourself, in the way you behave. So is the pastor up here saying tonight that a Christian doesn't live like a Christian? No, I'm in the middle of the road, honey. I'm not over on the right where you are when you misinterpret and misapply this passage. But I'm not over here on the left saying you can do anything and it's all good either. Yes, right. No, but Paul is saying, if you're dead to unbelief, then do not yield your members. Do not allow yourself to become a partaker in those things which are born of unbelief. Now there, I could go into so many examples in this. Uh, there, oh, heavens, there's so many examples. Amen. When somebody mistreats you and does you dirty and the sin nature, the unbelieving nature would say, I need to get vengeance. I need to do something. See, that's the unbelieving nature because that unbelieving nature is not believing that there is a God who says, 
Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. Amen. Paul said, don't yield your members. Don't let that unbelief this is why you get Christians wind up going out and murdering the guy that had an affair with his wife. This is why you wind up with Christians who go out and plant bombs somewhere because the guy did them dirty in business. Do you follow what I'm saying? Yeah. They're yielding their members in response to unbelief. But if you're dead to unbelief, and if you genuinely believe, then you should not be allowing yourself to, to uh, unbelief to manifest itself in your actions in this way. What should be manifesting itself in your actions is your belief, your faith. Yes, that's right. Do you, do you follow? Are you yeah. following what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah. But you see, when you hear this preach without fail, they wind up going down the sexual road without oh, fail. It's Lord. all about yeah. sex. That's all, that's all God ever talks about, don't you know, with sex. <laughs> but Paul is talking about unbelief manifesting itself. What did we say about the very nature of sin? All sin is disobedience, number one, born of unbelief. Every time we get in the flesh and we do something in the flesh, as we like to call it, it is the byproduct of our yielding to unbelief. Instead of trusting God, instead of believing God, instead of taking Him at His word and taking Him at His promise, we're acting from a standpoint of unbelief. As a child of God who is dead to sin, that ought not to be. Amen. You follow? Now, he goes on to say, <clears throat> uh, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Again, our actions then ought to be based upon our faith now, our faith nature versus our unbelief nature. I've said it before. Uh, there have been times in my life and in my ministry, I remember years and years ago when I was pastoring my first church, uh, somebody came to me and told me there was a lady who had two children, and she did not attend our church. But she was in desperate financial straits, was having a very difficult time. And one of my church members, Leo and Sue, came to me and said, this lady really needs groceries. Is there any way we can help her? And I said, yes, there is. And I went to the apartment that I had set up on the, the floor, underneath the floor, where we were having our meetings in this office building. I've told you about it in the past. I went down into my apartment, and I emptied my uh, food supplies, my pantry, I guess you might call it. I emptied my pantry into boxes, literally, in bags. Emptied it. Put it into boxes and bags and stuff. And brought it to that lady and gave her those groceries. And one of my church people said to me, well, brother, how could you do that? You didn't leave yourself anything. I said, I am coming from a place of faith. That lady may not know for a fact that God's going to take care of her and she's not going to starve to death. She may be afraid that her kids are going to go hungry and she's going to go hungry. She may not have the faith I have to believe God. I said, I can give all that I've got away because I know God ain't going to let me starve. I know I'm not going to go hungry. I know the Lord's going to take care of me. I don't have a question in my mind. I'm yielding my members unto righteousness. Hello now that is born of my belief and my faith. Do you follow what I'm saying? So Paul is saying, rather than doing those things which are born of unbelief, we ought to be yielding ourselves so that we're doing those things which are born of faith. Amen. I know a lot of Christian people, they wouldn't give a sandwich to a starving person because they're afraid if they give you the sandwich then at the end of the week they won't have a sandwich to eat. Hello now. Uh -huh. yeah. 
They won't help somebody, brother, with finances because they're afraid if they help that person with finances, at the end of the month, they won't be able to pay their bills. They are not yielding their members. Are you hearing me now? They're not yielding their members as instruments of, of, unru uh, of uh, excuse me. <laughs> they are not yielding their members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Right. If they were, their actions, every action they had would be born of faith and belief. Yes. Tommy looks at me cross-eyed sometimes. Because of the way I do things. Anybody gets to know me very well, looks at me sometimes, and thinks, is he out of his tree? What is he doing? Why would he do that that way? Because I can't help but act in faith. I can't help but yield my members as instruments unto righteousness. I cannot help but do those things which are the byproduct of my faith in a living God. I don't just talk faith. I don't just say I believe in God. I don't just say I trust the Lord. I do. And if you do, according to James, if you have faith, then your actions will demonstrate that faith and support that faith uh -huh. and manifest that faith. Hello now. Because faith without action is dead being alone. Amen. I've got a family member in my family who's supposed to be a Holy Ghost filled Pentecostal Christian lady. And I'm going to tell you, I've never seen anybody in my life I'm just going to say it plain because I'm not saying her name or anything. Most selfish person I know on this planet. One of the most tight-fisted, selfish, ungiving people I've ever known. Used to work a job at a school. And they would come around and say, oh, you know, we're taking a little collection for this person who's having a baby or for that person who's, you know, getting married or whatever. And she'd respond with, well, nobody took a collection for me when I got married. Nobody took a collection for me when I had a baby. If you can't afford to have a baby, you shouldn't have it. And she would opt out of participating in all kinds of things. And she did it all because according to her, boy, she was justified in it, you know. According to her, that was just foolishness and stupid and crazy. Of course, I sat there and thought to myself, yeah, and your testimony is going right down the toilet with every person you work with and everybody because God forbid you act like a person of faith. You're so worried about, I ain't getting my way because then when I need to pay my bills, I won't have the money. What? What? Who am I hearing that from? I know I'm not hearing that come off the lips of a Pentecostal Holy Ghost filled woman. No, it couldn't be possible. Because that doesn't sound like faith. My grandmother, my mother's mother used to drive me insane. Literally. Oh, she used to drive me insane. I never in my life heard a spirit-filled woman who could spew unbelief the way she'd spew unbelief. I never saw anybody in my life that was supposed to have the Holy Ghost who was so full of fear and unbelief. The things she would say and do that were born out of unbelief. Do you follow what I'm saying? Yes. See, we love... Preachers love to take this scripture, boy, and they got to go, brother. It's all about sex. It's all about whether you obey this law or whether you obey that law. Now, we know that isn't the case because, number one, we're no longer under the law. Amen. Getting ahead of myself. Verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law. But under grace. If you're not under the law, then why would you think this is talking about breaking the rules of the law? Amen. Uh -huh. Amen. This whole passage is not talking about whether you sleep with this one or that one. That's right. Whether you steal from this one or what. That is not what this passage is talking about. 
This passage is talking about the principle of our faith manifesting itself in our lives, our faith manifesting it in the things we do and the things we say and how we do things. Do you follow what I'm saying? Yes. And not letting unbelief manifest itself because we are supposed to be dead to that state of unbelief. Do you follow what I'm Amen. saying? Yes. So this whole passage is supposed to, brother, be talking about something very different than what you and I grew up Amen. in church here. Yes. Amen. Cracks me up how somebody can have hair down to their toes and dresses down to their toes. toes. <laughs> I guess everything they have goes down to their toes, sleeves, <laughs> tongues. <laughs> but it amazes me how people can, you know, have all this and be as selfish and as ungiving, yeah. be as compassionless. See somebody in the church hungry and pat them on the back and say, well, I'm praying for you and not do a thing in the world for them, which my Bible tells me is worthless. That's right. Uh, Amen. Yeah. My Bible tells me that has no value. Yeah. My Lord, have mercy. Do you follow what I'm saying today? Amen. You see, what I grew up being told this means and what God has allowed right. me to Amen. understand this is very different. Right. If you're a child of God, are you going to act and live different? You better believe you are. Amen. You better believe yes. you are. Are you going to live holy? You better believe you are. Yes. You better believe you are. Are you going to live godly? You better believe you are. Are you going to live moral? You better believe you are. But it is going to be the byproduct of your faith. The, your faith is going to be manifested in your actions and in your behaviors, in your responses and in your reactions. You want to know what somebody's really made out of. Amen. James said, don't look at what they say. That's right. Look at what they do. Amen. Oh, yes. My Lord have mercy. Praise the Lord. Trying to close up tonight. You know, I told you I have, a, I have an aunt. <clears throat> I was just talking to my brother Michael and my mom this afternoon about her. You know, I lived in their home for several months back many years ago, and I said, during the time that I lived with them, I found out that this good Holy Ghost filled aunt is one of the most vindictive people you ever want to come, and you don't ever want to cross her, honey. Because you ever cross her, and she will be more than happy to let you starve to death standing on her doorstep. And she'll serve dinner with you standing there looking through the door, watching me, and not think one thing. Now, my Bible tells me we're supposed to be doing good to our enemies. Yes, that's right. Jesus said, if you do good to those that love you, what thanks have you got? He said, even the sinner does that. Even an unbeliever knows how to do right by people that don't treat them right. Yep. What separates the saint from the sinner is that the saint will do right by the person who doesn't do the right. right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. I can tell you right now, you know, my father, there were many incidents in, in my life. When my parents went through their divorce, my father uh, was acting like, you know, he was taking it so hard and all this other. And I reached out to him. I went to his house. I sat in his bedroom while he was laying on the bed weeping. Literally. Held his hand. Literally. Tried to comfort him. Tried to, you know, encourage him. This man had done nothing but abuse me my whole life. That's right. Now, if I wanted to let sin reign in my mortal body, mm -hmm. I would have said, good for the jerk and let him be. Yeah. I can't do that. I guarantee you, God knows my heart that if something happened tomorrow and I was in a position to have to do something for Him, I would. I would, absolutely. I and I know I would. Because it's in me to do that. Why is it in me to do that? Because sin is dead to me. Unbelief, that state of unbelief is dead to me. And the only thing anymore that can manifest itself in my life is the byproduct of my faith. If I got stuff manifesting itself that's the byproduct of unbelief, something is wrong. Then that old nature isn't fully dead. You need to drive another nail through its head because it, it, it's not fully dead. 
Amen. Brother Warren Tatlock used to say, every once in a while you got to go back to the cross and hit those nails a couple more times. He said, not to hold Jesus to it, but to hold you to it. That's right. So every once in a while you got to, you know, hit those nails a couple more times to get yourself back on that cross. And that's the truth. Amen. Would you stand with me tonight? I believe we made it through verse 14. Praise God. This was good, 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 good. Amen. Amen. I'm telling you, isn't this wonderful? Isn't the gospel of Jesus Christ wonderful? Amen. Makes me think of that old chorus that says, Isn't he wonderful, wonderful, wonderful? Isn't Jesus my Lord wonderful? Eyes not seen, ears not heard, it's recorded in God's Word. Isn't Jesus my Lord wonderful? Isn't He wonderful, wonderful, wonderful? Isn't Jesus my Lord wonderful? Eyes not seen, ears not heard, it's recorded in God's Word. Isn't Jesus my Lord wonderful? Amen. Let's give the Lord a round of praise. Amen. Amen.